All right, so good morning, everybody, and sorry for the mess with the room. We're trying to shake things up a bit and try different organization. Next week should be back to, to the usual, ideally. So for today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Lorena. She's originally from Madrid, where she did her degree in biology, and then she got one of those high intro grants and moved to Sevilla to do her master's in uh, biodiversity and conservation biology. And two years ago, she started her PhD in the Lynx Genomic Group at uh, EBD, and this is what she's going to talk about today. The floor is yours. Thank okay. you. Thanks for your presentation. I'm glad to be here presenting my, my thesis plan, which is about inter- and intraspecific adaptive divergence in the Lynx genus, directed by Jose Antonio Godoy. And the firstly, I would like to present you my work group, whose members are Laura Soriano as the lab technician, Enrico Batsicalupo as the PhD student, and as I have told you, uh, Jose Antonio Godoy, the principal investigator. So with this in mind, I'm going to start with the conceptual framework of my, of my thesis. Uh, I would like to present you my model of a study, the Lynx genus. It is formed by four species. And this is a good, uh, the, uh, a good model for studying evolutionary divergence because of uh, some reasons I'm going to explain you later now. Uh, the first species are the lynx canadensis, I will refer to as Canada lynx, lynx rufus, I will refer to as bobcat, lynx lynx, Eurasian lynx, and lynx pardinus, the Iberian lynx. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that makes uh, Lynx genus uh, uh, good for model for evolutionary studies is their contrasting demography. This means that these two species are from North America and Canada, Canadians from Canada mainly, and, and from uh, North America, the bobcat. Uh, Lynx Lynx is well distributed among Eurasia, the part, uh, Russia. And the Pardinus, the Iberian lynx, uh, endemic of the Iberian Peninsula. Also, because they difference in ecology, the, in ecology traits as the diet habits, uh, uh, these two are specialists, while these two are gener generalists, are they different in sizes? These two are uh, smaller than the other one. Uh, but also, uh, their different environments, uh, as you may see, they are well distributed. So, they are, uh, they, there may be. Uh, select, uh, selective pressures because of different envi environments. And the last reason is the overlapping ranges. You can see here that they, uh, they both, uh, they both uh, uh, share habitat. So there's an overlapping range where they can and they do hybridize. And also for the past, uh, Iberian and, and Eurasian lynx has a past of hybridation because they, they, their habitats also uh, were shared to a point. Okay, talking about the divergence story of, of this genus, uh, the first uh, information uh, was made at uh, the, the end of the last century and it infers Canada and Eurasian lynx as sister species based on morphological traits and some gene sequences. Uh, the next uh, phylogenic, phylogenetic uh, tree uh, was inferred in 2006 and include, and include autosomal, sex link and mitochondrial gene segments and puts now Iberian and Eurasian links as sister species. And the last inference, the most recent one, uh, the, uh, again infers Canada and Eurasian lynx as sister species. This study was, fo uh, was a whole genome uh, sequence study focusing on low recombination uh, regions uh, of, the genome, of the genome, of the chromosome X. And that's why these regions are uh, resistant to gene flow because of they are for, of low recombination. And uh, they show uh, an, a story of hybridization between Iberian and, and Eurasian lynx. Okay. But we're, we, I have been talking about evolution, but what evolution exactly means? Evolution is a change in allele frequencies through time, and there are five principal mechanisms of evolution that are mutation, gene flow, non random mating, genetic drift, and the last, but the most important for my thesis, that is selection. Selection means that a heritable trait. Uh, may be uh, ca causing differential survival and reproduction of the, of the individuals carrying this phenotype trait. So, we have different types of uh, selection. 
uh, one is the establishing the selection that uh, this favors the stream values and if we can see for example in offspring number number of offspring the other one is the disruptive selection the contrary uh, that is fa uh, that favors both streams as we may see in I had an example in the big size of uh, Darwin in Darwin Galapagos and the last one is the directional selection in one one stream value is is select and this is what I'm going to focus on it can be negative if it's a deleterious allele and it will be disfavor or positive if it's a, fa a beneficial allele and will propagate in the genome and that's the mark it will look like in the genome I'm going to focus my thesis in positive selection because they leave a, comp a, a conspicuous footprint on genome and as the primary mechanism of adaptation. There are two approaches possible to assess this positive selection from two perspectives, the micro and the macroevolutionary. And these two perspectives talk about uh, when the events uh, were, were caused uh, uh, the in concrete, uh, no, Particularly, microevolutionary talks about recent selective events, and so it's good to be uh, uh, within, within a species and macroevolutionary about these deep past selective events, and that's what it, uh, is suitable for uh, analyzing uh, selection between species. Uh, now, going into objectives, these are the three uh, main chapters of my thesis, and what I have told you before, the I'm going to try to identificate adaptive divergence in, between and among lynx species. And then finally, the fitness uh, from a macro and a microevolutionary uh, perspective. And then finally, the fitness consequences of introgression between Iberian and Eurasian lynx. Okay, going through the methodology. The data uh, we have for this study is 175 mid to high coverage samples. Uh, world genome sequence with Illumina technologies and distributed that way. Uh, also, the computational needs uh, are the CESGA uh, servers, Finisterra servers, and EBD genomic servers. And my code editing and uh, storage is in GitHub. You have here my link. Don't judge my code, please. I'm learning. Uh, okay. About the data preprocessing, uh, we have three main uh, steps. The first step is the DNA extraction and sequencing. Uh, from this step, the most important is the, the, last, the last one, the last step. Uh, when, you, uh, when I receive uh, the raw file, the, the raw reads, I have to align them to a, a reference genome. In our case, we're using cat genome as the reference for the four links species. And then uh, we do a variant calling. Uh, variant calling means uh, getting the, the SNPs, the, varia the variants of the, of, of the reads. And the variant calling file passed through a different step of filtering uh, to clean the data. And I, and I get what, what I want to, to analyze. Okay, the next step is facing data. In this step, we uh, go from genotypes to haplotypes. And what does this really mean? This means that when, I, uh, when the data is unfazed, uh, I got this type of genotypes, and I don't know if this G usually uh, tends to be with the, with the A or with the T. And with the phasing process, we are sadly known the typical haplotypes, uh, uh, how are the typical haplotypes. And that's one of the steps uh, I did to the data. And then other steps was polarizing data. Polarizing data, data means inference the ancestral and the derived allele. Ancestral, uh, al the ancestral allele is the one who is present in the most recent uh, common ancestor, and the derived is the one who is uh, specific of uh, my lineage. Uh, how did I make this? Uh, with parsimony uh, inference, uh, without group parsimony inference. That means that I use Tiger, serval, and tiger, serval, and cat genome as outgroups, and and the four lynxes were my in-group, and that's how I infer ancestral and derived allele. Okay. Going through the first chapter, 
the microevolutionary approach. Uh, in this chapter, I aim to identify functional sequence through genome scans, and what I try to see is the selective sweeps. What is a selective sweep? A selective sweep is a reduction. Here you can see the reduction in, di in diversity, in genetic diversity, near the, the beneficial allele. This will be the beneficial allele, sorry for <laughs> Uh, because of uh, because of uh, linkage disequilibrium. Okay, what happens when a pos uh, when a positive allele appears in a population is that it will go high in frequency very fast, uh, and the nervi the nervi alleles will sweep up in frequency in population, uh, making an an aplotype, and that's the signal I, I I want to explore. So I'm going to, to use these delinked disequilibrium methods that may, uh, means that there's non-random association uh, be, uh, between alleles. And the idea, the concept I want you to understand is the extended haplotype homozygosity. The extended haplotype homozygosity is that what we can see in this step. What happens when a beneficial allele uh, appears in a population is that at first, uh, is uh, less frequent in population, but as, as it is beneficial, it will grow up, and the surrounding alleles, as I told you before, will sweep up also in frequency, leaving this mark in the genome. This is like the mosigosity of the genome, and we, we will see this mark in the genome. And that's the extended haplotype homozygosity. We will see an haplotype around the selected allele, non-variation non because of linkage disequilibrium. Okay, time, as time goes through, recombination and mutation will restore this and the la the we will not be able to see this signal because these uh, this sites will uh, start to bar vary. Uh, for this approximation, I use the integrated haplotype score and cross-population extended haplotype homozygosity and uh, also another method which is composite likelihood ratio based and it's called LASI. Okay, uh, now I'm going to show you uh, preliminary results from this chapter. Uh, uh, what we have here is the genome positions at uh, the X uh, axis from chromosome A1 to chromosome F2 at the same here. These are two results from two methods, two, two different methods, are in y-axis the score of the methods. Uh, the, the main difference, one of the difference of the two methods is what we are looking for. These points are SNPs, uh, variants, particular variants, while these uh, methods look for genome windows of 100 variants, okay? So from these methods, what I want is the outliers. I cut off and I extract the, the extreme values of the distribution. Okay, but not only this, I did a double check in order to um, uh, not having a f a false positives. And what I did is that I only consider those regions that are positive outliers for th uh, both methods. And that's what we can see in this graph. In this plot, uh, I represent uh, with X the, the integrated haplotype score results, outliers, and with points, the LASI outliers. And here, what we can see is the region, the intersected regions. So these regions are putative selected regions of the genome of a uh, particular uh, Bobcat. It's an example. Okay, with these regions, I pretend to do a gene enrichment analysis and that means looking for genes, proteins, or functions uh, overrepresented in these regions that will be mm, will, uh, say that these are selected. Okay, but not only this, I also make a, sp a species comparison to see the similarities between between a species in this in these overlapping in these regions putative selected and also the difference with the cross-species analysis. This analysis uh, is the same uh, as the other, but uh, what, I, what we can say from here is the differential existence of this extended haplotype homozygosity present in one species but not in the other. So this outlier will talk about 
that one uh, of the species has an extended haplotype homozygosity that n is not present in the other. Seeing the difference between species. species. Okay. For the second chapter, uh, we're going to identify the adaptive divergence from a macroevolutionary perspective. And here I try to identify functional sequen sequences with lineage-specific acceleration. Uh, what does lineage-specific acceleration mean? Well, uh, typically it's an excess of non-synonymous substitution. Why an excess of non-synonymous substitution means selection acting in this area? Um, you can imagine uh, that non-synonymous substitution means changing not only in codon, but also in protein and maybe in function, in the, fu in the protein function. So if you have a genomic region uh, which is uh, enriched in non-synonymous substitution uh, compared to synonymous substitution that doesn't change the, the amino acid at also uh, and so doesn't change protein function, is uh, maybe because selection is uh, uh, favoring this uh, region, this coding region. Okay. But also, uh, we are trying to assess adaptive divergence in a structural variation among a species. And that means deletion, duplication, insertion, and, and inversions. Uh, that's difficult to assess when you have gene segments, but as we have a genomic level, uh, we, uh, uh, we will try to assess uh, this structural, uh, structural variation. So, uh, well, okay, here you have the deletion, duplication, insertion, and inversion. With uh, the novel genome assemblies uh, up to chromosome level the, for the for, uh, links species and comparative phylogenomic tools uh, using branch site tests, we, uh, we will try to assess this, um, this lineage specific acceleration, as I have told you. And with the results from this, the same as in the first chapter, look for uh, overrepresentation of genes, proteins, or functions. The third and the last chapter of my thesis will be the finite consequences of introgression between Iberian and Eurasian links. As I have told you at the start of the talk, um, the most recent inference of the phylogeny of the links genus put Canada and Eurasian lynx as sister species, but having into consideration that Eurasian lynx has a long story of admixture uh, with Iberian lynx. What does this admixture mean in terms of genome? Uh, here we have two species, and when they hybridize, the genome starts to uh, share sequences, and at the end what we have is something like that. We have an organism that share parts of the both uh, original species. So this introgress region from hybridization can have a beneficial, which is adaptive, or deleterial, which is maladaptive, result for the recipient species. And here we have the three potential outcomes. The species with recent introgression, this recent introgression could be neutral, uh, so it will be, uh, it, it will pass through time uh, the same as neutral regions in the genome, maladaptive, so it will, try, uh, it will tend to disappear, and adaptive, it will tend to increase in, in frequency in the population or in the species, in the recipient species. So with that uh, conceptual framework and with uh, the results from my partners, Enrico, that evaluates admixture pattern between the lynx species and the results from Daniel, Daniel Clayman that has characterized genetic load in Iberian lynx, uh, knowing genetic load as deleterious, deleterious um, mutation, deleterious selection, negative selection. Uh, so combination of these results with my results about selection patterns across the genome be between and in species, uh, I will try to assess the fitness consequences of introgression for these two species. And then, to sum up the implications of my, of my thesis, that the results derived from this thesis aims to clarify the system tracing and characterization of different local adaptations in and between species, if selection had had a clear effect in lineage diversification, 
If introgression as the result from hybridization between Iberian and Eurasian links are result in finite changes, and uh, to find out the convenience or not of considering hybridization as a tool for genetic rescue. And thanks for watching. That's all. Thank you, Lorena, for a very interesting talk. Before we start with the question, and in case you don't already know, unfortunately, our second speaker is sick, so we had to cancel this talk. I don't think Lorena is up for 40 minutes of discussion, but we could still take a little more, maybe, than the, the 10 minutes we had originally allocated. So who wants to start with the questions? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, nice, uh, nice thesis. So you defined evolution as the change in allele frequency through time, uh, which I concur with, uh, with that definition. <coughs> but the genetic drift is the change in allele frequency over time, too. I mean, it's a different behavior, different dynamics. So mm, from the, the map of genomes that, uh, that you have, and I think that you have a, a, a large sample size there. Yeah, exactly. So my guess is that uh, you know where these uh, genomes come from. I mean, individuals living somewhere. Yes. Perhaps I missed that, but... Uh, um. Well, my, my point is that uh, when, when you detect a polymorphism, whose variation can be related to, uh, can be related to some kind of uh, environmental change or, or uh, habitat type, etc., like, like this one. So uh, then you know that uh, you got something that can be under selection. So uh, are you considering to relate the uh, genetic genomic variation that you will find with some sort of ecological cue or putative uh, selective pressure that this kind of uh, distribution maps can give you? Can you repeat it, please? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, all, these, all these individuals come from yes. uh, different places that you yes. can characterize ecologically, yeah. right? So uh, one way to define or to differentiate a drift from selection is when uh, you have polymorphisms whose variation can be related to ecological differences from where these individu yeah. individuals uh, have been grown, et cetera, et cetera. Are you planning to relate the, the genomic variation that you will find, because you will find a bunch of genomic variation, with this kind of ecological data that you can get uh, from, from here? Okay. Um, so this is like a population <laughs> perspective, as I understand you. And uh, our, our partner, my partner Enrico, has uh, characterized these uh, patterns uh, re in relation to climate and em environment in, uh, in Eurasian links. In Iberian links, uh, it's not um, suitable because of the bottleneck they have suffered. So what you, you are seeing does not account for the real story. And in the population of Canada and, and Bobcat is being held by another groups. So I'm having a perspective of a species uh, more than populations in uh, in a species. I don't know if I have asked uh, answer you. No, yeah, but uh, yeah, the difficulty is always to differentiate drift from selection. Yeah, that's the that's the, the difference key point if, of if the it's whole. random or not random. Uh, right, but uh, still, it's it's <laughs> you know it's a, it's a hard thing to do. But uh, obviously, you have ecological data from there that yeah. uh, can give you some hints about uh, why you observe particular patterns of variation in particular genomic regions. That's that's my point. Okay. You know. No, I I I didn't consider that. Uh, I don't know how good or if I should. <laughs> well. Give it, give it a thought. Okay, <laughs> anyway. thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Lauren. Great. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a, a little bit of uh, a question along uh, Chavi's lines, but I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it in a, in a different way. So I think, you know, selection 
uh, operates on phenotypes. Okay, so so what matters whether an organism lives or, or dies or leaves more offspring or, or fewer offspring is the phenotype. Uh, and the phenotype was a bit absent in your in your talk. So so I think a little bit of what Cherry was getting at is is you know since you're inferring selection. Which traits do you think might be under selection, and which environmental factors do you think might be affecting them? Um, and also, when you look at the uh, these SNPs or these genomic regions, so when you do the, the enrichment analysis, um, hopefully if you have good annotations of your genomes, and hopefully you do, um, then you you can have some go terms and you have some some idea of what genes those could be. But I think it would be great if you could have also or you could think some a priori hypotheses of which traits and which mechanisms might be under selection so it's not a complete fishing expedition yeah. you know so you, you, you probably have I mean is it is it I don't know the fur that is different is it their physiology is it their their, their trophic ecology yeah. is it do they need different enzymes to digest different uh, diets so you know those kind of things you can think a little bit ahead of time then you can have some operator hypotheses and see how well they match what you find yeah yeah I'm, I'm uh, I think there are two perspectives or avoiding uh, selection or evolutionary force and typically the, the, what you try is la, uh, to explain difference uh, in phenotypic or morphological traits uh, by genome but I was trying the contrast like is looking in the genome for signals to avoid this. I, I understand the point but I think there's two perspectives of saying the, the same, or, or it can be combined, yeah. Uh, just, just one com comment, I think, you know, I think evolution is a bit, of, a bit more of a broader concept that just changes in a little in, in a little frequency, so I disagree a little bit with you and Xavi, but that's for a discussion for another day. <laughs> okay. Another question? I'll have one for you, but um, oh, did somebody raise their hand? No. Okay. Can you show just your last slide? This is a question from somebody who's, your work is not my area of expertise at all, but you mentioned how hybridization could be used for, I want to say genetic rescue, was it? Uh, yes. And so my question is, can you explain concretely how this works? What? Having conservation, like, Genetic rescue in yeah, or, or how 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 this could be applied uh, for uh, conservation. Uh, the idea is that at, at the start of the Iberian lynx conservation program, uh, they consider the need of uh, genetic rescue from the from the Eurasian lynx. Uh, with my thesis, I pretend to abort if the introgression, the past uh, hybridization process and the introgression that now we can see in, in, in Iberian lynx has a positive or a benefit uh, consequences in, in, the, in his genome. So that we can uh, assess is if it is convenient or not, the hybridization with the species. And also uh, knowing that the sister species is Cana Canada one and not um, uh, Eurasian one? No, uh, uh, the contrary. <laughs> you know, Eurasian and Canada, the, the mm -hmm. sister species. So uh, having everything into consideration, uh, we could assess if it, if it is convenient or not. Thank you. <coughs> More questions? Yes. I just had an easy curiosity question. Uh, I was wondering how you get the sample. Is, are they just blood samples uh, where you get the DNA from? Uh, I think they are blood samples, but from collaborators. Okay. <laughs> and uh, someone from our project. And uh, I don't know, uh, my director <laughs> knows <laughs> better about this. Yeah, I was just wondering if, uh, you know, so the way that you get the sample would would bias, you know, uh, the representation of the population. Um, but yeah. I suppose with blood sample, it, it would be fine. I was wondering yeah. if some would come from hunting or, you know, uh, yeah. you know, illegal they trade or something. To cover uh, populations, uh, yeah. as I have uh, uh, shown in the in the map, 
they are covering uh, the main populations uh, in nature species. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. And we have one question on YouTube <laughs> from Jairo. Uh, so he's starting by saying, nice talk. And following the question of uh, the previous, previous questions, is there any possibility that the different number of samples from the different species of lynxes could affect your result? Uh, the second part, yeah, you, you have almost 20 samples from both American species, but more sample from the European species. Yes, so. yes. that's why, uh, that's because uh, they come from different projects. As I said, the, the, these come from collaborators and these are uh, from different projects. Uh, but this doesn't mean an influence in my results because uh, unless it will be such a small number that doesn't cover the, 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 the genetic diversity of the species, is not a problem because what, I, what I'm say, uh, seeing is variants, uh, SNPs, uh, within and in and between population. So uh, if I have 100 or 200, the genetic diversity of this species is what, uh, what this is and can, cannot be sobre, sobreestimated, overestimated. Thank you. So we have one from one more question. And if not, no, going once, twice, no more question. So thanks again for your talk. Thank you. And good luck with everything. Thanks. <laughs>